Hi, my name is Peter Pilgrim. I am the founder and organizer of the Java Web Users Group in the UK. I recently discovered a lost tape in the attic. This is Patrick Lightbody's talk to the Silicon Valley Bay Area Users Group, which took place on Monday night, the 15th of May, 2006. Here, Patrick talks about WebWork 2.2, which is now incorporated into Struts version 2. I'd like to personally thank Mike Van Whipper, the, the jug leader of the Bay Chi group, for his guidance. This is uh, the introductory part to the previous WebWork video, which was published on Google Video. Enjoy this one, especially from me. I guess I just propose if you're a Java web developer and spread the word, you might as well just take over that jug uh, uh, six to seven refreshment thing on Wednesday night. So I'll be there. So uh, that, that's my suggestion to get together. Um, I guess one other thing is we may not have any meetings for a little while uh, because I'm starting at startup. My last day at Fair Sign was actually last Friday. And, uh, thanks to Team. Uh, watch the staff team. Uh, thanks, Dean, as a person Koi, that is our host for this evening, so to be here. And I'm hoping we, in the future we might still have meetings here, but um, I, because I'm starting this new venture, I'm going to be pretty busy, and I know Don's really busy, and I think we're both very open to anyone else that would like to get involved. And the hardest thing is finding speakers. I mean, I know how to get the space, uh, you know, through the network of people in the Valley, but it, the hardest thing is getting speakers lined up, and people are willing to speak like that. So. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Um, I'm going to turn over to Don and introduce Patrick and uh, enjoy the event. Thank you. One more announcement to add to that. The Struts oh, group yeah. is going to be having a birds of a feather, a bop, Wednesday at 5.30 in the pavilion for all those who are going to Java 1. The goal is to not just sit around and meet each other, which we're doing at many venues such as this. The goal is to get into the technical aspects of struts and particularly start laying out the road the roadmap for the next few months to six months. So if you're interested in getting in the technical dis type discussions on struts, where it's going, and getting into some of those type of discussions, please join us. Now our next speaker for tonight, is this thing on? It is? Okay. Our next speaker for tonight is going to be talking about Web work in action. How many of you use struts? Show of hands. Okay, quite a few. How many of you use web work? Not bad. Okay, a few. Well, this is the perfect meeting for you then, because our next speaker has been a web work developer for the last two or three years. He is the architect of the latest version, Web Work 2, and which we'll be talking about later in the session in Java. We are the next version of Struts Action is going to be a merger of web work and struts. And this man right here is one of the lead architects and is making that happen. So please give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Patrick Lightbody. How's everyone doing? Good. All right. I, I didn't see those hands, and that's actually one of the questions I asked. Don's kind of screwing me up already. Uh, <laughs> well, can we do struts one more time? Everyone, don't be shy. All right, that's almost everyone. Uh, web work. Hey, some of you guys are holding your hands up both times. You guys are crazy. Um, all right. Uh, what about what, what about some other ones? Um, tapestry. This guy again? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> You're a joker. Uh, and let's see what else we got here. Uh, JSF, Chael. Uh, all right. Spring MVC. Come on. Okay. Uh, what else do we have out there? Wicket? Uh, okay, I'm going to give up. That's, uh, I, I got a, a good idea of who we're talking to, I think. Um, well, as, as Don mentioned, I, uh, I, I've been involved in web work for the last few years, and uh, we have sort of decided, uh, the web work team and the struts team together, decided that why are we spending all this time developing pretty much the same thing. For those of you that uh, raised your hand twice uh, for struts and web work, you know that they're pretty similar. Um, and we figured we'd uh, be able to get a little bit more out of the framework and out of the community if we put them together. So what what is happening is uh, struts to action framework 2.0 will be uh, basically web work plus some additional uh, features that 
the Struts team are contributing, one of which we're going to go over today that Don actually wrote. It's pretty snazzy. Uh, and uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at web work code, which should be very similar to Struts code, more or less. There are still open discussions, and if you want to get involved with them, please come to that BOF and uh, let, us, let us hear what you have to say, because we've We've got a lot of ideas, but uh, what really matters is what you guys have to say and what, it, what affects you the most. So uh, I might as well get started. I'll look at the code. You lose all respect for me. <laughs> it's bad. I'm not kidding. Um, but uh, Open Symphony is sort of a sister group, a sister organization of OpenQA. The idea is to, instead of center around open source Java frameworks, uh, like Open Symphony does, we're centering around open source QA tools. So again, if uh, if, if, you, if you don't feel like giving me a call about open, uh, any sort of web testing, at least check out the stuff at OpenQA. They're pretty cool. Um, for this startup, I was working at Jive Software. They make some Java forum software that I think all of you have probably used in one form or another because they're in, almost deployed at just about every Java developer site now. Any of the ones at uh, Sun, Oracle, Veritas, uh, a bunch of companies all, all run them for their developer, lab, their developer communication support <coughs> communities. Uh, and I was doing professional services there, as much as I, I enjoyed that job consulting and uh, the hourly, hourly style of work kind of got to me, so I, uh, I decided to do the startup. All right. So we are going to, today, we're going to talk about web work. We're going to first just introduce the high-level concepts, uh, compare it to some of these other frameworks. I got a few, uh, few tapestries out there and a few spring MVCs, so we'll kind of talk about what the difference is, what it means to have an action framework versus a component framework, and uh, what that means in terms of differences of how, you, how easy you can build different styles of applications yesterday, and what that means for today, and what that means for tomorrow, going forward into the future, and do those differences, will, will they have an impact they might have today? Um, we will also talk briefly about the Struts merger, specifically about backwards compatibility for Web work users as well as Struts users. So we're we're trying we're going to try to cover both bases. They are both very much work in progress. So don't take anything I say as set in stone. It's far from it, and uh, we want to hear your feedback on ideas for how we can handle a, a migration and upgrade for all of you users. Um, and I want to talk about the basic features of web work. We'll look at what it what it takes to create an action, what it takes to do basic validation. Some of the UI tags that are in web work are very different than some of the other tags you might have used in struts. Um, and we, we hope that you'll like them and use them. They, they offer some interesting side benefits besides just printing out HTML tags, for example. Uh, we'll take a look at how we're trying to explore rapid application development with web work and moving forward into struts action 2.0. Uh, any of you use Ruby, Ruby on Rails? One guy back there. Some of you might, might use it, but just afraid to raise your hand because there's a war brewing. Um, but uh, we're actually, I, I've been caught, I've been caught uh, dissing Ruby on Rails a couple times. And that was before I did my homework and I checked it out. It's actually a pretty neat thing. Um, and there's a few things that Java frameworks can really learn from it. Uh, there's certainly stuff that Ruby can do that Java can't. Uh, there's definitely things that Java can do that Ruby can't. And they both have, they both have their place. I know it's cliche to say it's not nearly as exciting. Uh, than to just say one's better than the other. But there's certainly things that our web frameworks in the Java space can learn from. And some of those we're trying to, to bring into the Struts, the Struts future and make it a lot easier to do rapid application development. Our hope is that some way through, through the framework itself as well as through uh, support from other, fr other frameworks and other libraries, as well as possibly Sun or via JSRs, we can finally get us to the point where you can actually just type your code tab over your browser and see the changes, uh, and not just for JSPs. We have some of that working now, but it's uh, very much wor uh, work, in, work in progress. And lastly, we'll look at some of the AJAX support, because no presentation these days is complete without AJAX in it. Uh, all right, let's get on. So an overview of web work. Web work is, a, at its core, built on the command pattern. Command pattern, if you don't, aren't, aren't aware of it, is about the simplest pattern in the world. I don't think there is one simpler than that. Uh, it says create an object, maybe set some properties, and call go or execute. Just call a method on it, and that's it. Very basic pattern, and it can be used for the foundation of a lot of things. It can be used in workflow engines. It can be used in um, maybe triggers, any sort of uh, scheduling system. It can be used in web frameworks. 
So we use a command pattern for all of that. Um, web work is a little different than struts in that it works directly on basic Java objects, Java beans, POJOs. You don't necessarily have to implement any sort of interface or extend a base class. Uh, so for those of you working, working with struts, you might be familiar. You have, you have to sort of set up your, your form bean as well as your action. You have to extend some base classes. In, in web work, it's very loosely coupled. Um, I guess non-invasive or lightweight is uh, what the, the latest term is called. Uh, but basically, it just means you can, you can map to any object. The actual benefit of that is probably pretty small, realistically. Very rarely do I think you're going to actually find, there are, there are people that do this, and there are people that get some real value out of this. Uh, but rarely, I think most of you will probably build actions that are specifically made for the web. And being able to extend a base class wouldn't be a big pain. But it's just something I wanted to point out. Um, in, in addition to that, the action and the form beam that you might be used to in struts, these two different things. One, for those of you who don't use struts, uh, in struts there is a, an action that actually does the execution, does the thing, responds to a URL that's being posted or edited. Got. Um, but uh, then there's also your form beam, which is responsible for taking parameters and bringing them into your action. So they're, separate out. they're separated out. The thing that gets you the data and the thing that does something with the data are two different things in, in struts. I think there's a lot of motivations for that, and I may be wrong when I say this, but I'm, it, it seems like one of them was from a long time ago when struts was first built, when earlier versions of JVMs, 1.1, uh, 1.2, uh, garbage collection wasn't very good. And so creating a lot of objects was actually something that might have cost you some performance, some memory management. Um, and so struts, one thing it offered in its actions, and it's actually something that web work doesn't, and that, that's actually a little bit of a problem, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, struts off offers more of a life cycle to its actions. So a single action is actually reused uh, across multiple requests, assuming you properly clean it up. Um, so in web work, we don't do that. We combine everything together. There is just a single object. The parameters from your web request are applied via setters and getters. And your action is your action's execute method. It's actually a method called execute. Is called after those parameters are applied. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, we use an expression language called OGNL. O G N L stands for Object Graph Navigation Language. It is similar to the JSP expression language, but offers a few additional features that can be very very nice to use. Some of those we'll talk about a little bit when we discuss data binding. That is, how do you map a parameter coming from a form, request, a form uh, submission or a web request to your Java code? How do you bind that data? Uh, but some of it is also very valuable for when you're displaying data out. For example, suppose your action provides a list of person objects, and you want to display a drop down, uh, a select box, that has the email address of those person objects. If you, were use, if you were just generating your code directly, you'd loop over those, per, those person objects, iterate over them using some sort of tag probably, and then, um, and then print out your option tag, your HTML option element, and the email address inside of that option. WebWork provides some tags also, which we'll discuss, that take care of a lot of that. They, they when given a list, will print out that whole HTML op element list for you. I think Struts has, Struts has something like that too. Well, the trick is with Ognol, it allowed, because of its advanced features that the JSP expression language doesn't have, you can actually do what's called projection. This is one example of, a, of that is in the expression <coughs> language, but it's not in the JSP expression language. Projection is the idea of take a list, and then for each item in that list, loop over it and call some, get some value from each object in, the, in that list and put it into a temporary list. So you could project on that list of people and get out just the email addresses. So you could still provide a temporary list of your email addresses that you wanted to a tag that's already there. You wouldn't have to write your own HTML. So that's just one reason why we use Ognol, and we're really hoping to get away from Ognol at some point and get back into the JSP expression language, because we do want to be standards compliant, especially as we move to a larger community with struts. All right, uh, we have an, a, an advanced validation framework. Uh, it's similar to Commons Validator, if you guys have used that. It provides some additional features. It binds closely in with Ognol, and uh, it's, it lets you do some fun things, especially when we start getting Ajax involved. Let's see that in a moment. Uh, the extensible widget system, we've got to come up with a standard name for that, but those are basically those UI tags I was talking about. The ability to print out HTML that's more than just 
an input field or a submit button, but WebWork actually goes beyond that and prints out the stuff that is typically set, found around those things. Labels, error messages, uh, formatting, alignment, styling, that kind of stuff. Uh, and lastly, WebWork supports lots of different view technologies. For the most part, how many of you guys use JSP? Yeah, pretty much. Anybody use a template language like Velocity or Freemark? Yeah, a lot less, but it's but it has some values. Especially, are you guys using it? What why are you guys using it? Is it because you just like it? It's faster, or do you uh, maybe ship things and bundle things in with jars so that you, something sort of a deployment model that JSP doesn't support? Yeah. The one example we have was uh, desire to implement everything ourselves instead of using template frameworks. Okay. Bad decision. <laughs> Bad decision, quote unquote. Well, you know, sometimes building your own frameworks, that was actually a question I meant to ask. Anybody here not use a web framework and write their own framework? You, yeah. Uh, now that you call it a bad decision, no one else is going to raise their hand. Uh, okay. Just one point of uh, order, which is um, if you want to get questions here. on the recording, uh, I can use another mic to you. Or I can, uh, or you can, I can repeat them. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So uh, I apologize to the listeners who are listening now, but I'll do that from now on. Um, but uh, yeah, Velocity and Freemark are great template languages. They are really useful, especially if you're working on an application like uh, Jira. It's a bug tracker. Some of you might be familiar with Confluence. It's a wiki that's made by the same company. I worked for Jive Software. They made a forum software. It's really valuable when you're trying to provide a plugin framework for your applications, and you want people to upload those plugins. And that's a manner that JSP doesn't really support easily. Uh, some application servers won't deploy that model at all, won't support that model at all, or support it in really hacky ways. So allowing, allowing a framework that allows for pulling template languages, template files, out of, say, the class path, rather than specified in some WAR and some more rigid structure that JSP requires, is really valuable depending on your use case. If you're, if you're writing a basic web app that doesn't have to have some of that type of modularity and plug-in architecture, probably just fine with JSP, and that last bullet doesn't really mean much to you. But uh, it is something we, we care about a lot and will continue to support. Those same tags, by the way, the extensible widget system, they, we abstracted out the tags away from the JSP tag lib library, uh, or API, and so all the tags work on any, any of the template languages. All right, moving on. By the way, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand. This is a, I mean, we got a pretty tight group here, uh, pretty close in. I'll repeat the question. And uh, I'd like to make sure this is a really interactive session. I think we, uh, we can have a good time here. All right, so I've talked about actions, uh, the, the plain old Java objects, the Java beans. In addition to actions, there's two other core pieces to web work. One of them is the result, and the other is the interceptor. A result is basically, it's a lot like an action. It's something that has a single execute method, and it can be given some parameters. And all it, the only difference is that it happens after an action is executed. So common results, and these are ones you're never going to really build. You're going to just use existing results built into web work. But common results are like the redirect result, or the servlet dispatcher result, which helps you render out a JSP. The free marker result renders out a free marker template velocity result. There's also an action chaining result, which will kick off another action invocation, which some people get, can get tangled up with pretty quickly. I know I have, uh, but other people have found a lot of value in that. Um, there are some other there are some other nifty results we can we, you can build on your own. That's where we do the Jasper reports integration. If you need to render out a PDF or an Excel spreadsheet that has any sort of reports, there's a lot of options there. You can build your own results too. It's just a basic interface you implement, and uh, when you return a particular key, you can map that key from your action into a result that gets executed. And so it's a reusable result you can bind to many or many actions if you like. Uh, interceptors are much like filters in the web in a web application. They are executed before all, before the call stack all the way down to the action. The action is executed and then they come back back all the way up. So you can as a, with an interceptor if you wanted to build one, you could prevent the action from being executed. You could change a result. You can do all sorts of fun things there. Um, and I think I've got a little graphic of that. All right. Uh, we mentioned form beans and the value stack. I'm going to come back and talk about the value stack in a second. That's a really interesting topic. So here you can kind of see what uh, what the interceptor action or result look like. There is a way to hook an interceptor into executing after the action executes or after the result executes. 
uh, sort of just changing the interceptors. The pre, it's called the pre-result listener. So I guess it's before the result, after the action. So if you want to hook in there too, that you, you do have that option as an interceptor, but this is the basic way interceptors hook in. All right, uh, getting started with web work is pretty easy. It's uh, just like struts and any of these other web frameworks. Typically, uh, you come in through a filter or a servlet. We are trying to, to encourage everyone to go through with a filter now. Uh, web work used to have an entry point of a servlet that you might map to. Start out action, if you're using struts, you're familiar with start out do. I think other systems use the same kind of, same kind of mapping. Um, we want, to, we want to get away from that for a couple of reasons. As web frameworks get a little more complex and offer more functionality, as you, complex is a negative word, as they offer more functionality, there is more that the web framework needs to be able to respond to. As we were building out AJAX support, for example, there were a lot of static files that we needed to pull out, JavaScript, CSS, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. And we didn't want to require that you have, you'd have a more complicated deployment process we don't want to say, OK, you've got to load up this servlet, or you've got to copy these files to your web app. We want to make it really easy. So we started recommending that everyone use a filter. With the, so the filter mapped to slash star, as in every request, handles everything. And if it can't handle it, if it's not loading, say, static content, or it's not responding to a web work action, it just lets the request fall right through. And so it, the overhead is very little. Um, so that's that's. Basically, all you have to add to your web.xml your web is a single filter, map it to slash star, and you're good to go. The actual mapping of URL patterns to requests is done through a, a, a thing called an action mapper. For the most part, you probably will not touch this. The default action mapper is the one you're all familiar with, which is star.action. But you do have the opportunity, if you're building an application where you want to have long-lived URLs and maybe not necessarily expose out your implementation, because most people, I think, know that if you have an extension that ends with .do, that means you, your application's based on struts. If it ends with .action, your application's based on web work. Maybe you don't want to necessarily expose that. So you could actually write your own action mapper that has its own techniques and own URL patterns that are a lot cleaner. And you can even change the entire underlying application someday in the future. And, and you wouldn't be bound to .do or .action. So it's just something to think about. We're not forcing you to do that. We're not even, uh, we're not even necessarily pushing it right now because it's not our default our default mapping system. And it'll it will sort of package up a, a built-in Jetty application server for you and deploy that. So it's a great way to get started and if you if you use Quick Start for development, which is highly recommended, you can switch over and deploy it on any application server because in, in the middle of it it's really just another Jetty servlet container. Alright. Any questions? Okay. So the filter I was talking about, this is pretty much what it looks like. That's it. That's the entire setup for web work to get started. There's, there are other options you're eventually going to do, but uh, for, your, for your day one, playing around with things, that's all you have to set up. Turn my phone off. That'd be embarrassing. All right, work. And uh, we apologize for letting that bleed through because I don't think most of you will care about that. But it's called xwork.xml in struts. I think we're calling it strutsaction.xml. Uh, definitely a more valid name. But in there, you specify package structures. You can map these packages to namespaces. Inside of each package, you can have one or more actions. Those actions can then be bound to a particular request. Uh, and so on and so on. So let me uh, let me show you what one of these looks like. So here's an example xwork.xml. The very first line is the most important line. If you're going to get started with web work or even struts, although maybe we should just automate this. You shouldn't have to really do this. But it's web work you do right now. The idea is you need to include a built-in web work default uh, XML configuration file. This is important because it sets up some of these built-in standard interceptors and results that really piece together the core functionality of web work. A lot of the very basic functionality, like applying request parameters onto your action, is actually done via an interceptor. So if you were to run your actions without setting up one of these, these pre-built stacks, these interceptor stacks for you already, uh, your action's not going to do much. It'll get called, but you won't have any parameters. And we do get that, that, that question in the forums every once in a while. So if you're going to get started with xwork.xml, that's the very first thing you do. You include that. Uh, that's, loaded, that's loaded up from the class path, and any other include can also be loaded up from the class path. 
It's a great way to build modular jar files, especially if you're using Velocity or FreeMarker as temp your template language. You could load up your entire partial xwork.xml, which looks just like this. It's, it's actually a full xwork.xml, but the assumption being it'd be included in another one. Um, you could load up your actions as well as your templates. So you can have these tiny, these tiny jars that offer limited function, basic functionality. That's, that's what a lot of these applications I mentioned before, like Jira, Confluence, and Jive Forms, use as their plugin system. All right, the next, the next thing here is this package block. Packages are just way, group, ways to group actions together. Inside of a package, you can define interceptors and results. You usually won't, so it doesn't matter. But if you do, they're going to be bound to a particular package or any package that you extend from. So you see here, we extend the WebWork default package. That package is defined, uh, not surprisingly, in the WebWork default.xml file that we just included. So by extending that package, we're inheriting in all the interceptors and results that came from that other, that, that other package. We call this package default. And then inside of there, we define the action. So the action here is list people. That's going to be kind of my running example here, talking about people. Um, list people is your class. The name is list people with a lowercase l. And inside of here, we map a result to list people.jsp. Now, because I didn't give a name for that result, that you can also specify an optional attribute inside of the result. Result name equals success, error, input, any, any type of string you want. Because I didn't give one, it defaults to success. That's just one of our efforts to try to cut down on some of the configuration. Um, that's a very small effort. We're going we're gonna to go a lot further in struts. Um, but uh, you can specify multiple results. So you can say result name equals success. Go to list people. You, then you can have another result name equals uh, input. And the value could be list people dash input dot JSP. And now when your action, it's execute method, uh, which has a string return type. All you have to do is return success or input to render one of those two different results. Results also have a type parameter. Again, if it's not specified, it inherits the default type that is defined in the, in the package, which in this case is the parent package of WebWork default. The default type is a servlet dispatcher type, which would be what you'd use to, to bundle in with JSPs. But if you wanted to put type equals Jasper reports, then you could point to an XML file that generates out your Jasper report system. Uh, your, uh, your report. So there's a lot of options here with this result, uh, this result mapping type of system. So you didn't see any interceptors configured there, but there are actually a lot of them. I think they were up to 15 or so that we provide built into web work. Some of them are a lot more important than others. Applying HTTP parameters, HTTP parameters is probably the most important because you're not going to do much unless you can get your data. Um, other, other interceptors that are part of the, the basic stack, we've got logging in there. Uh, you, could, you could add your own for basic security, standard kind of AOP type of security transactions, logging. Can anybody think of some other ones? Um, but there's more to that, too. We, for example, use a validation interceptor to call the validation framework before the action executes and say, hey, is this, is this data valid? And if it's not, we'll stop the entire stack. We just return a hard-coded string of input, which is a common kind of convention we want web work users to, to use, where input string maps to your input page, i.e. the form you were submitting from. And so the validation framework detects any errors. Uh, the interceptor will automatically return input. Action never gets executed. <coughs> That's another example of those. Um, we have some, some pretty neat advanced interceptors that are, are really exciting, and we actually don't, they don't get as much press as they probably should. One of them is this please wait page. So anybody you guys do searches for on Orbitz or uh, Expedia.com, and you, you look for a cheap airline, and it'll, you'll get this page that says, please wait while we, we, we search for your lowest airfare. Well, that's a, pretty nice, that's a pretty nice user experience, because you don't want the, a user to click submit, and then just wait there for 30 seconds. That kind of that's not a fun experience at all. Um, in fact, they'll probably, if they're like my mom, continue clicking, which only makes things worse. Um, so what we provided via an interceptor, which actually would, you can add to your interceptor stack without changing any of your action, any of your result, anything at all. You literally you just add an interceptor to your stack on your action. You can get that functionality automatically. 
um, what happens is that the interceptor, assuming it's, it needs to be the last interceptor in your stack, but as your requests come all the way down, the last interceptor will actually stop the action request from, from happening right then on that thread. And instead, it'll create a new thread and let the re request finish off on this other thread. And it'll, it'll store that in a local area, basically, in the session. Um, I don't know. I don't remember all the details. And then send the request back up to a wait page. It'll return the, the string wait. So as long as you've got a result mapped to wait, if you don't, then it'll use a default wait page that it's got built in. Um, as long as you have a, a result as wait, or you let it, you, you don't mind using this default wait page, which is kind of boring. You probably want one that's a little sexier that says orbits or says Expedia, it has a gnome on it or something like that. Um, you, you'll, you'll get that feature, and then what that page does is it, it reloads every few seconds. It's really basic. It's not Ajax. It's not as cutting edge as, the, as that, although you could implement a wait page that does that. Uh, but it just uses a meta refresh tag, reloads the page every few seconds. And that same interceptor will go all the way back down the stack every time we reload the page. And the interceptor will say, OK, well, I know someone's already running, so we don't need to spawn off a new thread. But is it done? And if it's not done, it sends you back to wait. And then finally, when it is done, it will run it, it or it will pick up that, that action that's already completed and send you back to the success page, showing you the results automatically. So that's just an example of the power of using some of these interceptors. We don't want to make things too complicated for you, so we're trying to keep them away initially for your 90% use case. But when you do have situations like this, it's a great way to plop something in, make it reusable for lots of different actions. So if you have this requirement in multiple places, you can implement it without hard coding the concept into your actions. And uh, you get some pretty cool features. Another one is preventing the, the double click problem. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with that. Someone, someone clicks twice on an important transaction. Some websites you've probably seen that say, don't click this twice. That's, that's probably not the best user experience. Um, Netflix, or is it Netflix? Yeah, Netflix, I think the way they do it is that if, if and that, this is not necessarily bad, they use JavaScript. They just gray out, disable the button whenever the first click goes in, so you, you can't click again. Of course, that doesn't work if, you're, if you've got JavaScript disabled, if that's one of your requirements. So we built a little interceptor that helps out with that. Uh, basically, if you're using this interceptor, there, there will be a token that will be associated with your form. It's a pretty standard pattern, associate a, a one-time use token. And when that token gets submitted, the interceptor will say, have we seen this token yet? And if we haven't, it lets the request pass through. If we have, it stops the request, won't let it execute. Well, that's, that's pretty standard. I think, uh, I think str does struts have that built in? Yeah, struts has that built in. Not, we, not as an interceptor. Yeah, but it has the, it has the concept, yeah. We went one step a little bit further, and we tried to do some tricky stuff. There are some downsides to it, and we can go over those if you guys are curious. But what, what we did is we said, OK, well, one of them can be, let's just display an error. You know, OK, this, tech, this token's already been used. Let's display an error. Um, problem with that is my mom likes the double click. And when she gets an error, that doesn't help her either. I mean, it's almost just as bad. So instead, what, what, what this interceptor will do, there's another one we call the token session interceptor. It will actually stop subsequent requests. It'll synchronize on a particular key on, uh, for that session. And it'll stop the second ones from going and wait until the very first one, the one that had the valid token, completes. And then just like that wait page, when it's done, it'll intercept those other, those other requests from going through and just pass you back onto the page that came through. So my mom could click 100 times as she's waiting. And she'll finally get the same result that would have been there if she had the patience just to wait once. Um, so that's a nice little feature, too. The downside to that is you, you, you could end up with lots of hanging, hanging threads while the first one finishes up. Um, probably won't end up with too many, because I think the subsequent HTTP connections will get a broken pipe right away. But just something to keep in mind. OK, those two features, the reason they work like they do is partly due to a, to a core feature in WebWork called the value stack. The value stack is this notion that instead of a single object, like a form beam, that you might get your objects, your uh, values out of and into uh, for displaying a page or for submitting values into, there's actually a stack of objects. In most cases, you are really only, there's only one object in the stack, so it's no big deal. But there are, there are a few cases where you might have multiple objects in the stack. So the, fir the first and most typical object that's in a stack is the actual action you're executing. So before anything happens, before the interceptor stack goes all the way back down, before we execute the action and come back up, 
uh, the action is created. We just new action, whatever action it is, and we pop, pop that right in the stack. So the stack is size one. Well, then we, then we invoke all the interceptors. Well, suppose we've got the, one of those two advanced interceptors we were just talking about that short circuit the request. Well, the action that's on the value stack now actually isn't the action we want. It's not the action that finished up. It's not the action that uh, we were waiting for. It's not the first, the first request. It's just some new action that has your, maybe has some values applied to it, uh, could have gone through some validation framework, could have done, there could be all sorts of things happening to it, but it's not the one we want. So what those interceptors do is they get the object, the action from the value stack that had previously executed the one that we do want, and they just push it right on the value stack. We push it right down. Now we've got two objects of the same type, maybe uh, search, search, plane, search airfares action, and there's two of them. There's one that's kind of the crappy one we don't want, and then there's the better one that has the actual values from the first request. And then they submit the, the page back to its result. And so at that point, the stack, the way it works is it kind of looks downward. So imagine we've got this stack of objects, as high or as low as you want. And, uh, and if, you look, if you look at it from the side, it obviously has a very different footprint if there's three objects in it than, say, there's one object. But if, the, if at the very top of it, the one object or three objects, if they both have the same object in it, and you look at it from above, it has a very similar footprint, right? Well, that becomes important when we get and set values. So when we get a value back, we say, OK, I want a list of airfares from the search results, uh, the search airfares action. Well, it doesn't matter if there's uh, that, the same action here and here, or there's just one. We're going we're gonna to go down from top to bottom asking each object one at a time, hey, do you have a list of airfares? And the first one that says yes and gives it to us is the one that returns. So that's why with a value stack, you can do loose coupling and, mim and make, make an appearance of a similar footprint without actually having the same data associated with your request necessarily. So that's a little complex. Let me see if uh, there's anything else I wanted to talk about here. Um, an example, an example of where the action, the, uh, the value stack also is valuable. So one example is in those interceptors I was talking about. Another one is this, this interceptor tag, or the uh, iterator tag, sorry, not the I words. Uh, the iterator tag is a web work tag, JSP tag, free marker, velocity, any of them that you want. And you give it a value. The value is typically an array, a list, a map, some sort of collection. And the iterator will just loop over them. Pretty standard stuff. I'm sure most web frameworks have that type of thing. The only, the only thing that's unique with it is that it pushes the object that it's currently iterating on onto the stack. So we've got that airfare one again. Or the example I've been using is this per person. Say we're listing a bunch of people. Um, and that list per the list people action has a list attribute, a get people list, which in, in and of itself ha is contained with person objects. There's seven person objects. So as we're, as we're iterating over those people, we're pushing a person onto the stack. So now we've got our action down here and then our person on the top. And it's getting popped off and pushed on each one as we go over there. Well, the nice thing about that is because, remember, if you look at it from the top down, the footprint is the same. Well, you can now do just a plain old basic no frills JSP static include that might be called person details. And you can include that person details anywhere you want, uh, say, as you're looping over these people. And that person details, all it, its only assumption, its only contract is, I'm assuming there's a person object on the top of the stack, and I don't care what's underneath there. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to print out properties on the top of the stack of things like a first name, a last name, an email address, whatever's related to the person. So now you can use that same person details in other places. So suppose you're writing a, a MySpace clone. And not only do you have a, play, a search results where you list a bunch of people, but you might also have an email functionality where you want to display who the two information about the to and the from person. Well, you could display that same person details JSP fragment, and as long as you're pushing that person object onto the stack before you include that JSP, then you can actually reuse the same JSP code. So it's a really nice way to do loose coupling of your view technology, your, your uh, JSPs, and uh, it's pretty low tech, but it works really well. Any questions about the value stack? I know that's kind of a lot of hand waving and stuff. Yeah. Um, so find value is an actual. That, that's just sort of the idea of an expression. It might come from any sort of tag. 
uh, the, the iterator tag or the property tag or other tags that look for a value. So the idea being, suppose object 0 has a name, a name property and object 2 has a name property, object 1 does not. Well, if we've got the stack on the right hand side and we're asking for the property name, it'll come from the first object. But on the left hand side, if our stack is now cut by 1, that's an actual syntax uh, square bracket 1. Sometimes you might want to need to actually, you want to get a little cut deeper in the stack for a specific reason. Um, it'll actually, because name doesn't exist on object 1, it'll find it in object 2 and return the value there. So, just a visual demonstration of that. Hey, I got another fancy slide transition. Okay, so let's talk about some comparisons of, of web work. We're going to get into some real code in just one second here. Um, so there's, there's always been sort of the web work versus struts battle uh, that is a moot point now, I suppose. Uh, but web work and struts are very similar. They're both action frameworks. And what I mean by an action framework is there is a mapping between a URL string and, an, and a method call on an object. That's an important differentiation between other frameworks like JSF, Wicket, Tapestry, which are more what they call component frameworks. I think that's kind of a fuzzy description, but the basic idea is that they're not mapping a URL to an act to directly to a method on an object. Instead, they're taking the more event-driven style of development, somewhat like Swing, although probably not exactly the same, right? Because this isn't a, a desktop application. But the main idea is that there is not a URL, there's not for every URL string some method you call. So in web work, we had that list, list people action we saw. So if you were to request HTTP localhost 8080 slash list people dot action, that maps to the list people object, which calls execute. If you were to go to foo dot action, it might go to the foo action and call execute there. It's very straightforward. Um, the downside to that is that you typically can't do as much component level designing where a single page might have multiple responsibilities, multiple forms submitting to, to different areas. It also makes state management a little more difficult. Um, so there's a trade-off between component and action frameworks. Some of you guys, there's a couple people here that use component frameworks. Uh, have you found it to be pretty straightforward to switch over from an action framework if you were using, say, struts before that? Anybody here? I saw, I saw a hand in the back. I started with JS. Yeah. Oh, OK. Any difficulties with that? Uh, no. OK, good. There you have it. So uh, JSF is a viable alternative. I think you all knew that, but uh, it's official now. Um, so one thing that's nice is uh, web, the struts community, now that, that Shale is a growing project, which Shale is a JSF implementation written by Craig, who, uh, Craig McClanahan, who actually was the creator of Struts. Uh, Struts is a, a community now. It's not a framework. In fact, it's invalid to say, uh, I work on Struts. Uh, it's, and I catch myself doing it all the time. But uh, it's actually Struts Action Framework. And then there's Struts Shale, which is another web framework. Nice thing is that Struts as a whole has both a component framework and an action framework. And so if there's any community that is most likely to find the best of both worlds, and, and find ways to cooperate between the other, and maybe even come up with eventually a single framework that lets you choose the different styles of development. It's going to be a struts framework, uh, sort of a struts community. Uh, just wanted to point that out. Uh, Ruby on Rails is actually very similar to web work and struts. It is also, for the most part, an action framework. It, uh, it maps URLs to a particular controller. Um, just basically an action. That it maps down to a method. Um, and that's typically, for most people, the simplest way to build apps and pretty straightforward. All right. Um, I covered all this. I forget. I hate it when I do that. Okay. So as we mentioned, the merger. So we talked about what the different frameworks are. The merger is effectively Struts Action Framework 2.0 will be WebWork 2.2, which is already out. It was released earlier this year. Um, and additional Struts features. There are some really cool struts features. I think one of them Don just built, so nobody's ever seen this before. Another one is uh, what's it? pattern pattern mapping, uh, wildcard mapping. I think is the name of it. I think that's a feature that only exists in 1.3. Not your head if I'm right. Two 1.2. Okay, it says new as 1.2. So any of you guys using 1.2, if you haven't used uh, the pattern wildcard matching feature, it's really cool. The idea is you can 
set up conventions in your application. Um, you can set up conventions in your application to map a particular pattern system. So you could say, I want all star uh, star edit dot do URL patterns to go to placeholder, like dollar sign one, whatever was in the star, edit action, class. So the nice thing is uh, it makes your developers easier. If you, can, if you can force a convention earlier, not only does it cut down on your configuration, but it kind of forces you to go through a standard style and might make your, your code in the future easier to handle. Everyone's going to do the same kind of thing every time. So it's a, it's a way to nicely build in conventions without ditching configuration completely. That's a feature we really want to get into web work as well. There's a lot of other features I'm sure I'm missing. Um, but uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity for some innovation in Struts Action 2.0. It's certainly not just web work, although for the most part it will be built on web work. So if you're going to be starting a new project and you want to be positioned to upgrade to Struts Action Framework 2.0, start with web work 2.2. That's probably your best bet. All right. Um, web work itself will sort of, in a way, cease to be actively developed on. So for those of you on WebWork, I hope that doesn't scare you. We're actually working on another patch release, WebWork 2.2.3, uh, and we'll probably continue to do so for the next year. But in terms of new features and new releases, we're not going to be doing that anymore. That will all be focused in Struts Action Framework 2.0. Um, the code developers community, all of that stuff, bug tracker, documentation, uh, it says moves to Struts. It has moved. Uh, Struts Action Framework 2.0 is now officially a Struts project moved out of the incubator, so that is now the past tense. Um, and moving forward beyond 2.0 and even parts of 2.0, we really want to focus on developer developer productivity and developer feedback. Uh, a lot of tools around that. We'll see, we'll see an example of something in a moment. But uh, to be quite honest, frameworks like Ruby on Rails and others, yeah? I actually do have a question. Uh, oh. I mean, well, so is the Struts user list going to be where all of these projects are discussed now? Shale? Uh, Action Framework 2.0, Prince Struts, yes. and many others. Yes, and that's that may lead to some confusion, and we're hoping we're hoping for users to prefix their questions with the particular framework they're using. And there's also there'll be tiles in there and some of the other Strut sub projects. Um, the reason we want to do that is we want to keep the communities close, especially as I mentioned, we've got an Action Framework and a Component Framework. We don't want them to diverge and never work together again. Now, right now, we haven't been doing a lot of code sharing. But that should and could change quite drastically. Uh, one of the ones that I, I, I kept harping on, just as a random example, when I first met sort of the whole Struts team down in San Diego late last year, was uh, reloading configuration files. That's something that WebWork does right now. It's a great feature. It allows you to develop, to, to make changes to your xwork.xml. You don't have to restart your, your application server. That's pretty annoying to do that every time. So WebWork will see that change, realize it's there, reload its config, and you're off to the races. You don't have to do anything. Um, that's something that Shale should do too, and if it doesn't do it, we're going to make we're going to make sure that it does. Uh, similar validation framework, resource bundle loading. There's a lot of options. Any of the AJAX features, I'm sure, can be can be bundled in there. So by keeping the, the mailing list the same, especially on the, the user front, we'll make sure that the the development community is able to see both from both sides framework the uh, both sides of the framework. We can see what is coming in, what requirements there are, and we can try to find ways to collaborate as as well as best as possible. All right. Tags, validation, data binding, they're all very, very important central features to web work, and we want to look at some code. So the UI tags I mentioned are, I think I've got a better visual representation for this. Um, so this is what a UI tag looks like on the right-hand side. That is basic form. I think you all write forms that look pretty similar to that. Um, typically, there's a label on the right-hand side. There is a form field on the left-hand side. There might be error messages when validation errors occur above or to the left of your form of your form element. Um, just pretty standard stuff. So what WebWork does that some other frameworks don't do is they provide you a built-in set of tags that can render exactly that out there in a really easy way without requiring you to build up your own maybe JSP 2.0 tags or your own JSP, God forbid, 1.x tags because those are a little more complex. Um, or doing JSP includes, or even worse, not, not modularizing your form building process. Uh, obviously, you, as, as much as you can reuse code, even HTML, it's, it's encouraged. And so we try to encourage that as well. 
Um, we'll come back to what that other graphic means in one second. So the UI tags are a platform for reusable HTML output, uh, UI, any sort of UI display code. Uh, the form controls that we provide out of the box are standard ones, all the main form controls, select tag, checkbox, radio, all the, all the ones you can think of. Um, we group templates that are rendered out from these form tags into themes. And so what's interesting about that is that each individual tag can actually spit out something uh, very different HTML depending on which theme you're using. So some of the themes, we've, we provide three built-in themes. There's actually a couple more than that. But the important ones are simple, which just prints out the form element itself. There's nothing else. No labels, no errors, no styling, no nothing. Just a basic tag. XHTML, which is a horribly named uh, theme that we need to switch, but it's basically two column. So two column layout. Labels on the right hand side, elements on the left hand side. Um, the one we the one we use now is tables. I know that's old school, and we should uh, we should default it to divs and style sheets. But uh, the same notion, the same concept applies. And then lastly, there's an AJAX theme. The AJAX theme just extends that two column XHTML theme and adds additional functionality in there, like client side form validation, for example. So as you tab through those form elements. There will, be an, there will be an on blur event that's registered, and then your values that you've already typed in are submitted in the back end up to a server. We validate it and pop in any sort of error message right on the fly. So a lot of people don't like to use these, and it's really unfortunate because they're missing out on some great features. Um, the author of DWR, which is a Java AJAX framework, came up to me last week at the AJAX experience and said, hey, I really like this validation stuff. We use struts 1.x. Um, I want to make sure that that kind of stuff is possible using DWR. That's what we use for, uh, for our AJAX client-side validation. I want to make sure that that's available in struts 1.x and 2.0. And we agreed, yes, that's a good idea. Uh, definitely will be there in struts action 2.0, but can we get it into the, the 1.x releases? It's possible, but it's harder if you don't have a framework like these UI tags for really standardizing how the HTML is printed out. So in Struts, you've got uh, in Struts Action Framework 1.1, 1.2, etc. You've got these tags that print out the form elements, but that's it. Well, if you need in, I use this thing. No, it's pretty good though. They bounce off the walls. You're probably writing your own HTML. Maybe you're using a table. Let's just assume a table for for the yeah, simplest case, no styling and whatnot. Well, we've got a row up there at the top, and there's a validation error. If you're trying to do client-side validation, you need to know the DOM structure of this particular form. You need to know the whole DOM structure so that if you've got, as you on blur out of a form element, and you need to add an error message above it, you have to know how to get to that particular table row and insert something above it. So if you're, using, if you're not using a standard structure for these tags, then it's going to be really hard for us to provide JavaScript that gives you some, a feature like that, built-in client-side validation, that knows how to manipulate the DOM because we don't know what the DOM is. You have to know. You know what the DOM is. You built it. You built the form. And so we, we could build it in, and we probably will, into some of the struts 1.x releases, but it's, it's not something that will come as free. Instead, you'd have to provide JavaScript that navigates the DOM and knows how to insert the error message at the right place. So we definitely, I mean, that's just one example of many where we really would encourage you to use these, these tags. Now, it doesn't mean you have to you have to settle on this kind of boring layout. You can come up with any layout you want. You can extend any of these themes and print out your own style, your own layout, your own uh, CSS, and then you can alter the JavaScript that navigates the DOM. Do it once, and you can, and all your forms will get that for free. Question: Any other type of type of element? Well, if we were trying to do uh, phone part one, phone part two, phone part three, and we set up three text fields. We'd actually get three rows, and that'd be a really lame-looking user interface, obviously. So there are times when it provides too much structure, and it does get in the way. If you've got an application that does that a lot, then you may need to come up with ways either, I mean, it may just be you don't use it. Sometimes that happens. Nothing, there's, there's no silver bullet for this stuff. Uh, or you might be able to come up with ways to utilize some of the other frame, uh, for some of the other concoctions that are kind of in here. There's actually a feature that's kind of built in there, not well documented, unfortunately. There is a, um, there's a parameter that you can apply to these tags called the after parameter. 
and it works only for the two column the two column system. And if you were to embed inside of that text field up there at the top a param tag, a WebWork param tag called after, then you could embed two more simple themed tags which don't print out the full table table cells and all that stuff in the, the row or anything, it's just printing out the, H, the, the HTML input boxes. You could provide those that back to back inside of that parameter and they'll all render out in a single call in a single cell. So there are ways to get around it. Um, sometimes it's not the prettiest thing in the world, and like any, with anything, as you add more structure in a framework, you're also going to provide more limitations. There are sometimes there are ways to, there are options like in this case, and sometimes it might not work, and that's just a trade-off you're going to have to, to to think about. But we do try to encourage as much as possible. We want you to extend, implement, and utilize all the different features that come in those templates. So. If you, if you go down the road and you, you want to use these UI tags, go, go look at the source to those UI tags. They're all written in a free marker template language. We chose that because it can, they can be spit out in a JSP uh, velocity or free marker uh, environment. Um, but go take a look at them and really try to understand them and see all the different parameters that are in there. And don't be afraid to, to overwrite them. Uh, there are easy ways if you provide in your own class path, in say web in classes, the same file but modify it, and it's in the same structure, which is slash template, slash theme, and then the template name, uh, .ftl, you can override it and provide additional features yourself. So that, that after parameter name actually came from when I needed that very same request, and there wasn't a way to do it at the time, so I just went in there to control header, which is a, let's jump over here to this, control header on every tag in the XHTML two column theme, um, the header, it's called controlheader.fdl, is wrapped around the beginning of every single theme or every single template. And so I just went into that that one place, or control footer, I could go into either one of those and just add this, this thing that prints out uh, an after parameter, for example, I put it in the footer, and I got my feature. So I, that's actually been committed into web work and unfortunately not well documented, but uh, that, that's sort of why we're trying to encourage you to get in and get dirty with these templates or something like that, you might want to just call that code, uh, validate validate a particular object. You, you'd have that object, submit it over to that service, and find out if it's validated. You can do that. It, inside of a validate method in your action, uh, you can do, and then you can also have your validation rules abstracted out to an XML file. Both are checked during the validation workflow, and so any options up to you. Uh, we provide several common validation rules in, for the XML format and the annotation format required. It wasn't even submitted. Uh, regular expression, you can pass any sort of regular expression you want. A date range, an integer, an integer range. And then you really need one, one that a lot of people end up using, is an ognal expression validator. That actually lets you bind in any, tor any type of ognal expression and have that evaluated to decide if the data is actually valid or not. And, and Ognal is actually a lot like Java, just like the JSP expression language is. It's kind of a simpler language, but it lets you do a lot of powerful things. And sometimes that's exactly a good point. All right, uh, this is some XML for, sort of the XML format for doing annotations. You see here we've got a field name, age, so the action would actually have a get age and a set age for, uh, field. Uh, it'd be probably an integer, since the field validator is of type int. That, that int validator can take two parameters, a minimum and a maximum. Uh, if you don't provide a max or a min, for example, it's just uh, your range that goes to infinity. So this particular validation rule is basically saying only teenagers can, uh, can use this form, for example. Only people 13 to 19. Um, the message is printed in straight English right here. It can be internationalized. There is a key attribute, an optional key attribute on the message element that takes an internationalization key that gets looked up from the standard resource bundle system inside of WebWork. If that key is not found, it will use the message that's provided here. And if that if one is not provided, then it'll print out the key directly as the validation error message. So you could put in keys as, a, as you're developing. You might not know what the messaging is going to be initially. You'll just see the key printed right through. That's pretty standard for most uh, internationalization implementations and frameworks. And, uh, that's, and then it could be populated later. So that's what so what a validation rule looks like. You can have multiple field validators. You can also have generic validators, which don't apply to a particular field. And the reason that there's a differentiation is a field validator will add the error message to a field, a map that maps fields to error messages. 
That's important because back at that, that table of all the forms and everything we saw, there are some error messages that are unique to a particular field, and then there are some that are just kind of generic error messages, um, sorry, your account balance is empty or something like that. Maybe you don't want to apply that to, to a particular field. You just want to display it somewhere. So we support both field validation level, field level validation as well as generic action level error messages. Okay. Um, yeah, we can do a quick demo of this, I think. resident maven guru so in the meantime okay we'll let that run and hopefully that'll just work and we'll come back and look at validation if that doesn't work i apologize to all of you and we won't be doing any hands-on code examples um okay let's look at data validation while that's going in the background uh, data binding that is data binding like i said is the ability to apply http get and post parameters onto your action it's a very common thing if you, I mean, pretty much everybody does it in some way or another, otherwise you would have a very worthless application. Um, the main, the root problem here is that HTTP as a specification was never designed to understand a notion of types. It's a type of artifacts that were part of my build instead of actually configuring up a whole web application. I know I did that kind of quickly, but, uh, oh, that's all right. We don't, we aren't going anywhere other than the showcase locally. Uh, so that was an example of where I've got, say, my application just figuring out what it needs to do based on the, the configuration of my IntelliJ modules. That's just one example of what Quick Start can do. It's trying to minimize the amount of deployment. So you saw I just ran that thing. I never had to package up a WAR or even copy my files to another directory. So let's take a look at continuations here. Hopefully they won't break. All right. So we're, we're being asked to guess a number 1 to 100. What number do we want to start with? That's a good pick. All right. Too high. Uh, what's another number? 25. All right. We've got real mathematicians here. Uh, you guys are better than me at this. All right. Uh, too high again. 12. Good one. Yeah. Too low. Oh, what are we going to do? 18. All right. If we don't guess it here, you're the one to blame. Good. All right, too low as well. What is it, between 25 and 18? Say, 22, I heard 22. This is our last chance. You got it, nice. Very, very nice. So you got it on the last try. Uh, now here's something that's funny with continuations. You see continue up here? It's uh, continue, blah, 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 blah. That's how we track continuations. Every single change, every single step in that continuation process is being remembered via a unique ID. Um, one, an additional advantage this has, except for in games like this, is I can go back and notice that continuation ID is changing every time. And so back up here, there's only this, this stack that's saved. There's only one guess that's happened. What was the number in 22? All right. I've decided that we're better. We didn't do it in six tries. We did it in one try. Voila. So it's a, obviously it's a cheating mechanism for, uh, for some games, but you would, uh, you would see the power of this in, say, a shopping cart. You know, the back button is handled automatically. The, a tree of every step you took in the code is remembered. So it's a really powerful feature. Obviously, it does come at a cost of more memory and more management and more processing that you need to do, but it's just something, something we're going to be offering and we hope to offer in some form or another in future versions of Struts. Yeah, I thought I read that this was